Welcome back, everyone. Good to see everybody online. We are um, going to be continuing with the Medicine Buddha Sutra this evening. <clears throat> um, and we are picking up on page 16, um, near the end of page 16, beginning of page 17 for the uh, BDK translation. So that's where we're going to pick up. Um, I was just had on screen an image of the Pure Land. So this is an um, artistic representation of the contemplation of Amida's Pure Land. Because in this section of the sutra, it makes a comparison between the um, Medicine Buddha's Pure Land and the Pure Land of Amida Buddha. So um, it is, if you've ever read the contemplation of the Pure Land Sutra, it is incredibly detailed with regard to all of the uh, aspects of the Pure Land. So it lends itself well to art, um, sometimes more so than reading, um, but it is a, a practice within uh, different Buddhist schools to actually um, visualize the pure land. So here's another, so I believe this is embroidered, uh, painted, excuse me, painted, I think, uh, image of, of the pure land. So you can see there's just tremendous detail, um, all the different palaces and terraces and balustrades and so the and trees here, uh, almost looks like Christmas trees. Um, so all the different, uh, the people in the pure land and the different assemblies and uh what it what it's like to be there so um very interesting artistic representation very very detailed so uh, we do have this sort of art um within the buddhist world and uh, it can be really helpful i think for folks um you know when they're reading and then trying to gain some sort of you know idea understanding of how should I visualize. So we'll get to that this evening as we go through. So first, let's, I'll put this up. Let's recite the verse on opening a sutra. I believe I forgot that last time. So we can make our study also practice. So the Kaikyoge, the verse on opening sutra. Uh, if you put your hands together in Gasho. <clears throat> Ujo jin jin ni myo no ho wa yoku sen man go ni mo ya u koto kata shi wale ima ken mon shi juji suru koto e tari nega waku nyorai no shin jitsu gi o geshi tate matsuran. The supreme, profound, and subtle Dharma is difficult to encounter even in 100, 1000, or 10,000 kalpas. Now I'm able to see hear, receive, and hold it. May I understand the Buddha's true meaning. So um, we're gonna do something a little bit different tonight. Um, if you bear with me, I'm gonna try to use some humor to illustrate some of the points um, in the sutra this evening, as well as um, some artwork and some stories. So this section lends itself well for that style. So um, we'll be a little bit more multimedia uh, and interactive this evening. So hopefully it works out. Um, so we left off the end of page 16, which concludes the vowels of Medicine Buddha Sutra. And then I'll put this on screen so you can follow along. And so we are just finished the vowels where the uh, Buddha is discussing with Manjushri that these are the 12 subtle excellent vowels. And so we're here 
at the Buddha land of medicine, of master of medicine, burial, radiance, Tathagata. So this is discussing the pure land. So it begins. Now this Buddhist land is absolutely pure and there are no women there. There are neither evil destinies nor the sound of suffering. So this is where we uh, left off last time. So I just wanted to recap in case anyone missed it. Um, Cause I think this is not as accurately translated as it should be. Um, if you refer back to the vowels where if someone is um, especially suffering from um, things that are specific to women, misogyny, um, sexual violence, uh, discrimination. Uh, you know, many countries, women are not allowed to be educated. Uh, in many countries, um, you know, many of the women do the cooking, but are the last to eat and there's not much food left. So the treatment can be very poor. So the sutra here actually says, um, you know, those forms for which, by which people suffer don't exist in the pure land. So one thing to keep in mind in a pure land is um, what, what is a pure land? And also in context, right before this, it says there are no animals, right? So there's nothing in the lower realm. So no realm where there would be suffering. Women are pointed out here because that's one of the medicine Buddha's vows to address the concerns and specific sufferings of women. Um, it is not a sexist statement because, and I, I think a lot of scholars miss this, they read it too uh, literally. The pure land is something that is a projection of the Buddha's compassion, their consciousness. Um, it is a place that you are reborn into, you direct your consciousness to. As such, once there, you don't have a body. So gender is very irrelevant. So it is not a statement about gender, it's a statement about um, suffering, hardship. So uh, I want to make that clear in context with the, with the pure land. Um, if you look at the, this is also the case with the bodies of the bodhisattvas, they are um, technically male, but incredibly androgynous. They are, you know, their bodies are soft, supple. They have a tiny little mustache, um, even the ones whose forms um, you know, look female. The point is not to, um, you know, we get very much, focused on the gender component, um, this is something that's transcending that. So does your, is your mind male or female? Is your mind, um, you know, is your mind your gender? Is your mind um, bound by gender? That is something we should be looking into. Um, I, I think the Buddhist response there would be no because when the doctrine of rebirth, you're not always born the same gender. Right? Sometimes you're female, sometimes you're male, sometimes you're the mother, sometimes you're the father, sometimes you're the child. Um, so what we want is to look at the, how we change, how our mind directs us through existence rather than you know, sort of read the text narrowly to, uh, to suggest some sort of uh, sexist intent that doesn't exist. So I wanted to recap that component. So here we also see um, the power of that space, what the meditative power of Buddha with regard to the pure land that you're reborn into, that is projected by their meditative power. And um, the way you actually obtain that rebirth is by making a connection with that Buddha. So how do you make a connection with the Buddha? <clears throat> After this section, there's a whole mini chapter on practices. So we will get to that um, perhaps next, next time. But in short, it would include things such as making offerings, the water, tea, flowers, incense, etc. So the sutra gives directions on the practices you should engage in to make that connection. Right. So if your uh, interest or intent is rebirth in that pure land, then making the connection is the important component. Um, within a pure land, the purpose is to further your study. So you're not done. You're like, oh, I'm reborn in the pure land. Okay, done. So it's not a heaven that should be distinguished. It is, um, it's like getting into college. 
you might be excited about getting into college, but once you're accepted, you know that you have a lot of hard work to do. Um, I don't think anybody gets kicked out, but you get held back a grade and maybe for as long as it takes for you to get the lesson. Um, so that is, you know, the, the nature of the Pure Land, it differs in that respect. Because you're there to study, because that's the purpose of the Pure Land, um, only beings capable of studying are in the Pure Land. So of course, the Buddha is not going to manifest, um, you know, forms, or you're not going to take rebirth in a form where you can't study or understand the teaching. So primarily, that would be, you know, obviously a spiritualized version, but a human type form. So we are capable of studying and practicing in this form. Not so easy. Um, he has an animal a house cat. I have yet to see a house cat sit in full lotus, but I, I've, I'm always surprised. Maybe there's one out there. Um, the heavenly realms are separate realms of, you know, the karmic consequences of good deeds, where it's primary pleasure. Um, it's not that you can't practice in heaven. You just aren't motivated to do so because you're having fun. Um, similarly, uh, I once went to Disney World um, in high school. I didn't see anybody doing meditation. Everyone's just running around having fun. So um, it, it's the purpose and the what the karma that got you to the place dictates um, the actions that you that you undertake there. Um, so if you look at the Medicine Buddha's vows, what is absent from the Pure Land are those things that the vows are directed at. So of course, there's not going to be animals, hell beings, um, sickness. There's a bunch of different things that would be absent from the Pure Land. So if you read it in that context, um, of course, the sutra is going to point out one of the vows is specifically focused on the plight of women. Therefore, the female form doesn't exist. Um, not that there's anything wrong with it, but there's then no reason for people to make distinguishing, uh, you know, well, maybe the girl should sit on that side of the class for the Buddhist lecture and the boys should sit on this side, right? They're not going to have this, these distinctions made. Um, if you read the contemplation of the Pure Land for Amida's Pure Land, uh, these details are, are written out in, in tremendous detail. It goes on and on and on. Um, so if you're reading the text, and I'll put this up. This is why I was showing the image of the Amida's Pure Land. Um, the ground is made of barrel. So the entire space is this deep, blue gem and the roads are marked with ropes of gold the walls and gates palaces and pavilions windows and curtains are all made of the seven precious substances it is similar to the joyous realm of the west so kavati so here specifically the text says the pure land is very similar to amida's pure land okay. so what what differentiates them is going to be the specific vowels so if you've been um encouraged, helped by the vows of the Medicine Buddha, as opposed to Amida's vows, and that's the pure land in which you would, you might attempt to practice. I think it's also helpful to, you know, if someone's wondering, well, why are there so many pure lands? Why not there just being one? Um, you know, we have the benefit today to search on the internet and find all these texts. Um, in the old days, you were unlikely to encounter all the sutras all at once. So there were different teachings for different people. And um, also specifically to the vows of the Buddha aren't just about our salvation. It's also our learning from them. So this section uh, that comes next really expands upon the lesson component for the vows. We can read the vows, but next comes you know, how you should actually live in accordance with them and why. Um, the benefits of the practice, this is sort of the, the benefits of the practice and then what the practice is. Um, we might expect, tell me what the practices are and then tell me the benefits. The sutra arranges it differently. This is why you should practice. 
and then tells you what the practice is. So the, the arrangement is maybe a little bit different than something that we be used to in the West. Um, you're also gonna notice in this next section, a lot of the focus is going to be on um, understanding your mind and your motivation for things, but always from a compassionate standpoint. And I think that's gonna come through as we go through the text. Um, but really looking at our tendencies so that we can reflect on them. So sometimes the teaching is there, it's very interesting, but we don't really have the ability to see how it's functioning for ourselves. So the next section is, is there to aid us in, in that level of understanding. Um, how do you have a connection? right, for the pure land. Um, what does it look like? What do practices look like? As I said, there are, you feel free to read ahead because it's fairly straightforward, but um, there are devotional practices that are listed out in the sutra. Um, in the West, within Buddhist communities, it's starting to change, but initially these were omitted. People felt that um, devotional style practices were not actually part of the Buddhist practice. They really looked at it as a sterile philosophy. Um, and they pushed those things aside in favor of meditation. There's a, a long history of why that is, but um, I think we're in a different stage now where people are coming to the Buddhist teaching out of independent interest in the teaching rather than running away from a different tradition or in reaction to a different tradition. So um, this is also the case within um, Shingon practice. If people are interested in, you know, how do you get from A to B? Or someone asked me, how, how did you become, you know, how did you get to do your, your training? Um, before meditation training, before ritual training, it's devotional practice and recitation and chanting. So the, the basic um, starting point, right? What would you say? Day one, temple life, chanting, and cleaning the floor, but chanting. Um, many people who are interested in going on and doing higher level practices um, are sometimes surprised that the uh, higher level practices are composed of recitation. So there's a lot of chanting within the practice. So to do um, Shingon training, you have to learn to, to recite the sutras. Um, and if you're too slow, you can't actually finish in one day so you that that comes first um the purpose of this is you're preparing your mind you're preparing your mind for what's coming next um if you haven't established that foundation it's going to be hard to meditate it's going to be hard to visualize um if you are as an example you know attempting to visualize a scene as complex as this um, much of the detail is in the sutra. So if you are familiar with the teaching, then, you know, if this is you in the visualization and you visualize yourself surrounded by the various deities in the pure land, um, familiarity with having recited the text only helps in that endeavor. So um, if you just read a bunch of names and you don't know the relevance to the teaching, uh, I have heard many people become disheartened with the practice, they're, they're not sure what they're doing. So, um, what else? Oh, kneeling and bowing, yes. Uh, sitting, seiza, and, and kneeling are also important prerequisites for, for practice. Okay, so we will, we covered most of this section last time. So just as a recap. So we will start here with the different cases of the manifestation of the saving power of medicine, barrel radiance, Tathagata. So the text begins. At that moment, the Bhagavad again declared to the youth Manjushuti. Um, if you joined us last night for the class, the overview of Manjushuti, we noted that Manjushuti is always um, described as in, in art as being a, a young boy, usually a teenager. So he says he declared to the youth Manjushuti. So it shows up again here in the sutra. 
Omanju Shuri, there may be sentient beings who, without knowing the distinction between good and evil, cling only to craving and avarice, and who, without knowing about giving and its fruits, are foolish and without wisdom and lack the roots of faith. They accumulate much wealth and treasure and strive to protect it. When they see a beggar approaching, their minds are not pleased. If they are compelled to give, they feel pain as if their own flesh had been deeply cut. Um, so this section that they feel pain as if their flesh had been deeply cut. Another way to translate this would be um, this person not understanding the merits or the power of giving or out of stinginess. Um, when they see a beggar, right, asking for a dollar, their feeling is as if the beggars asked them to cut off a piece of flesh. Um, so they recoil in that way. So it's a very, in many ways, a very poetic, um, you know, line to get across the feeling many people have. So if we have that feeling, then that's an opportunity for us to reflect. Um, if, if we see someone in need, and you know we're turning away with that sort of you know disgust or you know indignation how, how dare you ask me to give you my you know cut my flesh for you right when they've only asked for a dollar um that's an opportunity for us to to reflect it's also telling you that there are people who are like this right so even if if we say well i, I would never react that way um there are people that are this way so it continues moreover they are sentient beings with limitless greed and avarice. They amass much property, more than they need for their own use. How much less would they use it uh, to give to their parents, wives, children, servants, and maids, or workmen and beggars who come? So here we're getting a lesson, right? We're getting a lesson in generosity. So first, of course, the basic one, don't withhold your giving, especially don't generate a mind that has qualities where when you see someone in need, you're, you know, not just turning away, but, um, you know, generating negative feelings towards the need. So there's an opportunity to reflect that when someone asks something of you, it's not that you're required to give it, it's really required to look at how your mind responds. Right? So we can't give to everyone who asks, that's not skillful. But we can reflect on how our mind responds, right? We shouldn't respond with, you know, get away from me or, you know, what's wrong with those people? We should respond with compassion, as you see in the vows of the Medicine Buddha, right? So the Medicine Buddha making the vows says, in the future when I'm enlightened, right? So at the time he's making the vows, he's not able to uh, fix everyone's situation, but his response is to be more compassionate. So this is, asking us to generate the same type of compassion. Uh, so we shouldn't be thinking, uh, oh, great, here comes, you know, that person, I know they're going to ask me for, you know, X, uh, God, they're always asking, I don't like that guy, right? So it starts to generate negative feelings within us. So we want to be aware of that tendency and try to avoid it. Or um, I've heard oftentimes here, um, you know, Portland and Seattle, we have a lot of unhoused people. And I'll hear people say, um, you know, oh, there's more people living on the side of the road. You know, it's just their campsites are trashy. You know, those people are just, you know, they usually say something that likens them to being less than human. Um, practically speaking, you know, we can't give to every, you know, beggar. We can't give a house to everyone um, who is unhoused. I don't, I don't have a thousand houses personally. Neither should we turn away, right? We, we can't erase them by labeling them as less than human. We shouldn't um, fail to see that they're deserving or that they're needy, um, you know, they're somehow less than us. We should consider them in the same way we would consider our parent, you know, our child, our friend. If they were in need, how would we respond? So we are experiencing when we usually when we are responding that way we're experiencing some past karma so the sutra is saying look at your response and then you'll see what your own past experience was so that we experience the karma of our past action doesn't 
mean we condemn others, right? So if we see someone who's down on their luck, that may be the result of their compassion, their, their karma, but the fact that we condemn them is also our karma. So we should recognize how these things are, are operating. Um, the sutra will go on and talk about, you know, sometimes we think of it as positive and, and negative. Positive and negative karma are really dependent on um, our minds, right? It depends on, on our minds. We may see someone who's rich and say, oh, they have such good karma. Um, when I was living in China, people told me, you know, during the Cultural Revolution, anyone who had money was, was the enemy. So many people went and, you know, threw their money and jewels away because they didn't want to be labeled as, you know, reactionaries and dragged out of their houses and beaten. Um, and, you know, many people whose families were really poor farmers were like, oh, finally, you know, that's the safest thing to be. The safest thing to be is to be poor. So you're we wouldn't think of it that way, right? We were like, oh, when is it ever good to be poor? Well, in the middle of a revolution, right, where the uh, rich, educated, or wealthy are considered the enemy of the people, uh, maybe you prefer to be poor. Maybe it's your good karma to be poor at that time. So um, what matters, what's important is how we see it, where, where our mind is. Um, there's many people who have everything in the world and have tremendous suffering. Uh, I've known people who were on the you know, verge of tremendous poverty and were the happiest people. So it really depends on our, our mind. So when we have a tendency to label or judge or turn away from people's experience, um, we're looking at the situation incorrectly. So how do we change that thought process? We have to seek out ways to benefit others um, when we're working towards our own goals, right? So every goal that we have, there's probably a way to also benefit somebody else in the process, right? So it, it can be as simple as, um, you know, from time to time, you go to the grocery store and you inquire of someone, you know, can I get something for you? Or maybe you have a neighbor, you know, doesn't get out very much. So, you know, can I bring you something? Um, everything we do, there's an opportunity to make it about more than just ourselves. So even if we have our own individual goals, doesn't mean they always have to be selfish. There's a way to bring people in. Um, there's a way to include others in our own path. That's what the sutra is asking us to do rather than, you know, uh, oh, I have this goal. I need every single dollar. And that, that guy over there who's asking me for a dollar, you know, I see it like he's asking me to cut my leg off, right? So um, this is, we can, we're all susceptible to this, this type of thinking, depending on where we are and what's going on in our life. Um, so as these beings, after life has finished, will be born into the realm of hungry ghosts or of animals. So here it's talking strictly about the, or specifically about the karmic consequences of having that kind of um, lack of sharing. The, the feeling that you'd rather never you know, give anything. Um, so it discusses specifically the karma, karmic consequences of this sort of thinking or having this re revulsion, you know, being repelled by anyone who's in need um, so strictly speaking from a Buddhist point, you know, where our minds are is where our minds go, right? So whatever you think about in this lifetime is generally where you find yourself. So if you spend, you know, 20 hours a day searching the web for, I don't know, the, you know, the coolest coffee shop in town, you'll probably eventually find yourself at the coolest coffee shop in town, um, but similarly, if you spend a lot of time uh, pushing others away, the, you'll find yourself in a state of mind where um, either actual or metaphorical in the sense of ghosts or animals, um, because it doesn't really matter from a Buddhist standpoint, the mind is what's in control. What's the nature of those existences? So what's the nature of those in hell? They're consumed with their current experience. They're consumed with unhappiness, distress, and pain. Um, 
we can feel that now. What's the nature of those in the animal realm? They're consumed with finding safety, with generating bodily needs, um, with finding food, comfort. They're consumed with thoughts of reproduction. And then those thoughts dominate almost completely. Uh, there are people with that same thought process. So the mind, you know, where you are, what your mind is doing is going to determine your future, no matter what the outward manifestation of that mind is. There's a certain magic to observing the process though, right? So a lot of times people say, well, I recognize I have this mental process. How do I stop it? So we shouldn't think of it as strictly um, prescriptive. You can recognize or see that as you recognize it um, and you see like, oh, I'm doing that. That's happening. I have this feeling. Every time you bring attention to it, you take power away from it. And eventually, and this is why you know, we do any kind of practice or there's meditation, it's not just to be relaxed, it's to recognize that thought process and you know, literally get that hamster off that wheel. And so um, you're not just going in circles all the time. And when I was a kid in, in middle school, I had a hamster and they had a wheel and of course, they wanted to run on it at night and it squeaked and it would keep me up. And you know, initially you're like, oh, it's great to have a hamster, it's such a great pet. And then eventually you're like, I want to throw this hamster out the window. <laughs> um, your mind is the same way. Right? So the, every time you recognize it, oh, oh, it's happening, then suddenly it starts to become less of, a, of an issue for you. So there's a kind of magic in that observing, you know, calming the mind down enough to observe. The same is true with regard to uh, most everything mentioned in the sutra, the purpose of meditation is to observe the mind. You know, you reflect on the teaching and then you say, oh, I never noticed my mind does that. Now that I've seen it illustrated in the sutra, I can see it happening in myself. But if in a past existence, a human being, as a human being, they overheard the name of Master of Medicine, Beryl Radiance Tathagata. Even though they are now in an evil path, as soon as they think of this Tathagata's name, they will disappear from that place when we re reborn in the human realm of existence. They will obtain knowledge of their past lives, Jati Smara. So everybody always likes this. They want to know their past life. So we'll talk about this a little bit. Um, so having heard the name of the medicine Buddha while in the human realm, once they recall that memory, they will attain rebirth from whatever realm they're in and be reborn again as a human. So if at some point you heard the medicine Buddha's teaching and you find yourself in hell, what do you have to do to get out of hell and get back to being a human? You have to recall the teaching. When is it the hardest to recall good times? In the middle of bad times. So why should we meditate? Why should we practice? So that we can build up a stronger mind so that if we find ourselves in an actual hell or a metaphorical hell, because something is, let's say we're surrounded by, uh, you know, people who refuse to recognize that there is such thing as a communicable disease and it makes us nervous every time we try to go out and live our lives. And so we have, uh, you know, we get very agitated in the grocery store or, you know, a friend wants to meet us for coffee and we're like, I don't care if it's 30 below, let's sit outside just to be safe. Um, you know, we find ourselves in this, this cold hell. <laughs> How do we bring these things to mind? It's, you know, through practice. So this is a preparation. Um, so this is saying that if you did some practice in the past, or you even heard or ran into the teaching, you have this ability to then bring back that memory and that will get you out of that existence. Um, it's your get out of hell or animal realm free card if there's any monopoly players out there. Um, so the text suggests that this could have been in recent times or ancient times. So when it says past existence, the um, actual Chinese implies um, 
even in ancient times. So this could have been, you know, a thousand years ago that you encountered the teaching and now you're re-encountering it, or that's how you got out of the situation you were in. Um, and remember for, for, you know, Buddhists, these realms can be very short. You may have had a 10 second stint in hell uh, as a result of something. Um, you could have, you know, been there longer. Um, the same is true for, you know, our, our life. We may, um, you know, I've seen people terrified and then relieved all in the same moment. So, um, you know, these experiences that we have can be long or short. Um, the last part of that says they will obtain knowledge of their past lives. So we get, and we get a, we get a technical term. So they will obtain knowledge of their past life, Jati Smara. Um, Jati Smara in Sanskrit means th this is one of the superpowers, not really superpowers, natural abilities that come as a result of uh, spiritual practice. So for Buddhists, it's not special. Um, if you remember your past lives, it doesn't make you special. Um, it's it's a it's a thing what most people don't realize with that knowledge comes all the information from that life so it's not just oh i was a you know i was a princess in russia and i had all these jewels and it was great and that makes me special uh no it means um you know you remember the people you cared for and you remember them dying and you have all that grief or whatever angst you had in that lifetime um that comes back so any regret so it's it's heavy um so our perspective is if it comes out naturally through spiritual practice that's fine it's not something you should necessarily you know like oh i'm going to try to retrieve this information because it can be um crushing i've seen that people have retrieved those memories and um, it's not been easy for them to confront either who they were or what that means to their life now. So no rush on this, but um, this is possible. Why is it possible? Um, your mind remembers everything. What did you eat for dinner last night? You can probably remember. What did you eat two weeks ago on Thursday? probably don't remember but let's say you met with friends and I say don't you remember I you know I gave you the, me the menu but we went to that restaurant and you had to use the QR code and then you you got the special and you're like oh that's right I had this the knowledge is there um, similarly the knowledge of, of past lives is there too we just need to train the mind calm the mind enough for it to come back the same way that someone leads you through do you remember you know your you know special birthday when you were a young kid if you get enough clues, you can bring that information back. It's the same, um, it's there. Uh, you know, this is an area where I think it's quite mysterious that uh, even in this lifetime, you know, the mind has all this information. Um, we don't have a good scientific theory of how that works. Science can tell you where in the brain um, certain information either might be stored or might, the brain is responsible for translating that into speech. But, um, you know, if we compare it to a computer, the storage capacity for our mind is tremendously greater than uh, you know, thumb drive or something. Uh, it's not as easily quantifiable. So in that way, it, it's quite, um, quite unique. Right, we're quite unique. So the mind is is capable of a lot of things. So this term, um, Jatismara, really is supranormal knowledge. Right. So it is um, something that's recognized in uh, many many spiritual traditions as a as a thing. Um, the other part of this is the implication that your mind is the thing that's transmigrating, right? 
and this is another aspect that I think the Buddhist tradition gives a little bit more information for, right? So if if you think from a scientific standpoint, you get half your genetic material from your mother, half from your father. Are you only a clone, half clone of each, or are you more? Right. And then you say, well, of course, you've got your experiences in this lifetime and, and you know, your schooling, your education, and the times in which you live. But you know, are you only half mom, half dad, and you know, your experiences to this point? Or is there extra things there? Do you have interests your parents didn't have? Do you have talents your parents didn't have? Uh, do you have uh, insight right, that your parents didn't have? Probably some of you are nodding your head. Um, so the mind is, is more than just the genetic material. Yeah. It'll be a whole nother seminar on Buddhist theory of the mind, but get a little bit uh, it is nice when they include some of the technical terms here. So it goes on. They will think of the suffering and the evil destinies with fear and will no longer wish for wor worldly pleasure. So this is perhaps better translated as um, they will no longer be so attached to worldly pleasure. So in my case, you know, given the choice between uh, a week in the monastery or a week on a cruise ship, I will always choose the monastery. I'm not interested in the cruise ship. <laughs> um, so the idea being that you find simple things more interesting. So we have many wishes for world, worldly pleasure, right? Um, I, I, I was running errands today and it occurred to me, um, you know, how many products in the store were all about comfort. And um, so we have so many products to make life easier, more comfortable, more convenient. Um, you know, it the point where almost everything is discomfort avoidance. So for many of us, you know, we have to have a special bed. Otherwise, you know, we feel like we didn't get a good sleep. And then our perspective is our day is ruined for that. Um, we through practice, we can begin to be satisfied with less, with the day-to-day the -day normalcy is making us happier. So when our happiness is tied to things, specifically sensations, and that's what the sutra is talking about, is our, um, and by our, I mean humanity. Um, humanity's interest in chasing new sensations, um, that is sort of a, a dead end, right? So when we are not as interested in just sensory input, um, then things get easier for us. Now you can argue that everything is sensation, right? Any eating, any walking in the forest, any beverage is a sensation. And that is, of course is true, but what here is, what is meant is that we can't find contentment even though we're chasing after all these new sensations, right? We get something and it doesn't make us happy. For many of us, you know, a simple ice cream cone, you just be like, oh, that was lovely. That was wonderful. You know, you have a nice evening with friends and completely fine. Uh, for others, there's just a constant discontent. You know, well, it's not the ice cream I wanted or they didn't have my favorite flavor. It's just never, <laughs> never enough. So uh, when it was hot outside, I went for ice cream and I heard, I heard this too. Um, Oh, so one of the questions in the chat is how does this relate to the Siddhis? So knowledge of past lives is one of the Siddhis. Um, it is one of the, um, you know, natural spiritual abilities. Um, the others are, you know, knowledge of others' thoughts, knowledge of the future, knowledge of the past, knowledge of your past lives, of course. There's, there's some others. Um, you don't have to be Buddhist to manifest these. People you know, manifest them all the time. Some people are very sensitive to ghosts and spirits. We're getting close to Halloween, so that's usually a question I get. Um, those are just natural. Um, sometimes through spiritual practice, they become stronger. Other times through spiritual practice, they get turned off. Uh, many people want them turned off because it's bothersome for them. Um, it is very common 
that people um, you know may be sensitive to to spiritual things and they want that turned off because it's very hard for them to get along in life. So that is an area where by working on the mind, tuning the mind, calming the mind, you can uh, you can work on those those aspects. Um, some people, you know, it becomes stronger and um, a, a perfect example from Buddhist history is Mahamagdalayana. So the monk who, um, you know, sort of the, the starting point for Obon and uh, memorial services and things like that in uh, Buddhism, uh, he was foremost in psychic powers, the Siddhis. And so um, that's how he was actually able to, you know, sort of see his mother in the realm of suffering. So um, many spiritual practitioners have those skills. Um, it can be a gift and a curse. Um, you know, you can benefit people. Uh, sometimes, especially in Asia, there are people that's all they're known for. So they, they can never do practice. People are just coming to them for you know, advice along those lines. Um, when I was in Hawaii, there was someone who was very well known for that. Uh, and people would go and say, oh, I need a reading. And so they, they made appointments at the temple strictly for like, you know, tell their future, tell their future, uh, what's going to happen, tell me what to do, what to do. Um, and it became a problem because those people never worked on their own lives. They just, they couldn't, they became, um, what, dependent, completely dependent on, you know, asking that person. Uh, and so that, that's not a good way to go, but that, that individual, you know, well, Hawaii is not that big. So it's literally unable to escape it. Um, they would out to dinner, they would mob that person, you know, in the hospital bed, nurses come in, tell me what's happening, you know, and they're like, I'm dying. It doesn't matter. I need to know. I mean, it was very intense. So um, a gift and a curse for sure. But yes, the knowledge of past lives is one of the, the Siddhis. Now, um, complete recall you know, knowledge of all past lives is something that only comes with enlightenment. So you may get, you know, certain ones. Um, you might not get any, but some people who have knowledge of some, you know, may not have knowledge of others. So uh, some people, that's what they want to know. So they, they do practice and they try to do that. Others aren't interested. <laughs> um, the text also says, let's see, one sentence down, then we'll get to our, our funny break. Um, where did I off? They, oh, they will like to practice compassionate giving and they will praise donors. So um, Another way to, to translate this would be instead of praising themselves, they will learn to see the benefit of praising those who give. Um, right. So who who gives? Who's in the position to give? Do we praise those who give? Um, as a society, do we praise givers? Um, do we praise? Where's our praise usually focused? Our praise is usually focused on those who are fashionable. Um, there are whole networks dedicated to, in, you know, interpersonal drama, um, lives of entertainers. Uh, we even now have like dramas of lives in everyday professions. Uh, so I, I fully expect to see, you know, the, the drama of, of deep sea rock retrievers will be like the next big show. I don't know. Um, and it has an effect on our mind, right? We don't often consider it, but um there's there's this constant focus on praising um people who are not praiseworthy <laughs> and then we we fail to praise those people who are um uh, worthy of praise so here's your moment of funny some of you may be familiar with this uh 
sketch comedy skit. If you are, I apologize. You have to watch it again for three minutes. If you're not, uh, enjoy. So here's what we should be praising. Okay, so that's your that's your comedy break for the, the evening. Um, but impressing upon, we probably don't recognize as a society all of the things that we praise and get bent out of shape about that um, are not praiseworthy. Um, so I've been inundated this week with people asking me about some kerfuffle in the world of football. Uh, and since I don't watch sports, I, I don't know what it's about. But uh, I was sent this video by an elementary school teacher. Uh, and it is uh, still funny after a few years. <laughs> So um, this is what the sutra is talking about, right? Who do we praise? And have we learned or do we recognize to give praise to those who, um, who we really should be praising? What does that do to us? What does it do when we, when we recognize achievements of people who are really making a change? So you know, if, only, um, if only we had uh, you know, teaching center rather than the sports center. So, um, and if you didn't miss it, the calculus teacher was raised by the humble professional football player, his father. So, who was struggling paycheck to paycheck. Um, I'll put the suture back up. Um, he and Peel get uh, extra bonus points for that one because it was so culturally appropriate for America. Uh, says they will not be stingy with anything that they possess. They will even be able to successfully donate their own heads, eyes, hands, feet, blood, flesh, or any part of their bodies to whomever comes and asks them. How much more so will they be able to distribute all their property? Um, so this is a bit of an unusual component of the text, and it assumes knowledge of another story. So in the Jataka stories, the Jataka Mala, there is the story of Prince uh, Mahasattva. And so this is one of the Buddha's former incarnations. So prior to the Buddha attaining enlightenment, right afterwards, he, he recalls all of his past lives. And one of his lives was as a prince. And the prince encounters uh, a lioness. The lioness is starving and her cubs are starving. And she's contemplating eating her cubs and um, the prince and his brother see the scene and wonder how to help. And so um, actually have, let's see. I'll show you the, the story briefly. Um, so you can go on uh, Dung Hong, the caves and in, in uh, the deserts of China, they actually have the um, painting of the Jataka story dating from 581, so pretty old. Um, and it shows the very famous story where the prince tries to alleviate the suffering of the lioness and eventually offers his own body to the lioness that she can avoid um, the tragedy of eating her own children and instead. Um, actually see the, the painting devours him right so he gives his body freely so um, does this mean that you should give your body to starving animals no of course not um, it it is a practice in um, you know recognizing that we get very attached to the physical body right as I mentioned before and the sutra points out we get so focused on um, comfort, that we fail to see the needs of others. So uh, you, you do not need to throw yourself off a cliff to, to demonstrate this. Um, however, we see it sometimes, you know, even but organ donation, some people are like, no, 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 I don't want to do that. Or, you know, blood donation, no, 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 I don't want, you know, so there's a, you know, we see it right now with, um, uh, you know, the pandemic. People are afraid to do things that would benefit others because, you know, I might die, but I'm worried about this or, you know, these other things. So we, we can get very um, attached. 
How to do this though is focused in the, the next section. And the key um, to understanding this teaching is gradual practice, gradual understanding. It's not something that because it's written in the sutra, this is not a, a dogmatic thing. Um, well, you, you read this, so you should, you know, have no attachment to your body. No, it says gradually people recognize and start to let go. So gradual is mentioned several times. I want to stress that. So we shouldn't be reading this as, well, the Buddha said, that is not the point. The point of the sutra is that gradually we come to this realization, right? We don't have such a strong, uh, you know, attachment to the physical form. We recognize it's constantly changing. Uh, and so for that reason, we are relieved of some of the stress that we have in life. So moreover, Manjushuri, there may be uh, sentient beings who have broken the precepts, sila, right? Even though they have received various trainings from the Tathagata, there may also be those who, although they have not broken the precepts, have violated the regulations or those who have not broken the precepts nor the regulations, but have denigrated correct views. There may be also be those who have not denigrated correct views, but have abandoned the study of the sutras preached by the Buddha and are unable to understand their profound meaning. So here we have, um, and it's specifically when it's saying the um, precepts and the regulations, this is generally focused on monks and nuns, but can also be uh, more generally applicable to, to anyone. Uh, so you have people who've gone against the precepts, they're broken their vows, they've transgressed the teaching, um, or just given up. They felt that the teaching's hard, they've given up. So uh, others who have the teaching in hand, but for various reasons are unable to really grasp the meaning. Right? So it says there may also be those who have not denigrated correct views, but have abandoned the study of the sutras preached by the Buddha and are unable to understand the profound meaning. There may also be those who have learned but much, but because of their arrogance, their minds are obscured and they think that they are right while others are not. Um, this is, is more common among, um, well, practitioners and scholars, both can study the teaching, yet fail to grasp or fall into the trap of not studying it at all or willfully misconstruing the teaching. Um, I've run across this recently with some scholars. I've attended their talks and there's sort of a willful misreading of the text happening. Um, they eventually come to the, detest the Dharma and become the companions of Mara. So they become Mara, the personification of, of ignorance and, and desire. All of these foolish persons are led by themselves to practice wrong views, and they also drive innumerable millions of sentient beings to the great pitfall of danger. All these sentient beings will go to the hells or to the path of animals or that of the hungry ghosts, or they will endlessly remain in transmigration. So here is the danger, the danger specifically of slandering the Dharma. So if you decide a religious path is not for you, I'll say this a couple of times, if you decide a religious path is not for you, whatever that path is, just move on. Don't slander the teaching. Don't undermine the practice of others, right? Others may not be ready to hear what you have to say. Um, so if you've heard some other teacher and you decide, you know, now in retrospect, that person was wackadoodle, you know, don't go and make a <laughs> blog post, oh, this person's wackadoodle, right? Because it may um, throw someone else off the path completely. So um, whether Buddhist teaching or otherwise teaching, it can do tremendous damage to others, right? So slandering the teaching is not uh, something we want to avoid. So if you decide you, it's time to move on, you move on. Um, so others' faith or convictions may not be as strong, so we don't want to upset. Um, but there's no cancel culture in the Buddhist realm. I guess that's what, that's what we would say. Um, if someone's not good, just, just go, right? Um, also, likewise, if you're unsure of the teaching, just go. I've mentioned this uh, previously. Um, the Reddit 
thread for Shingon was owned by someone who was slandering the Dharma. Um, and I negotiated with them to, for them to give it up. And the reason for that was I didn't want them to continue slandering the Dharma. Uh, so there used to be, you know, this is the, the section on Shingon and it said a bunch of, you know, not so nice things. Um, and then said, you know, Buddhism isn't the way and you should choose this other religion. And so we want to avoid doing that kind of thing, either with regard to this teaching or, you know, any other teaching. It's not, it can be very harmful for people. So, let's see, hit the right window. But if they are able to hear the name of Master of Medicine, Beryl Radiance, the Tagada, they would immediately ban abandon their evil doings and practice the good Dharma, and they will not fall into evil paths. So hearing the name is not a magic bullet, right? You just run around screaming out Medicine Buddha and everyone wakes up. That's not exactly what this means. It, it's the that you've heard the teaching before, if you're able to recall the name, you can pull yourself out of the lower realms. So again, you have to think about what this requires. You have to be able to focus your mind, even in that lower realm. So it's a challenge. It's something beyond, um, for many of us, our current circumstances to think and outside of what we're currently experiencing. It is a type of meditation. So it's good for our life now, and it's good for those pesky emergency situations when you find yourself in a boiling cauldron being stirred by folks with horns in their head or something, whatever, whatever our favorite image of the hell realms is from the Avatamsaka Sutra, because there are many. Um, but also when we find ourselves here and now in the midst of um, tremendous suffering. So um, this is telling us that those who are uh, you know, dismissive of accurate information uh, we should not slander them. We should have compassion for them. So we have a lot of people right now who want to disseminate inaccurate information to the detriment of many people's health. Um, so how do we have compassion for them? This is what the sutra is talking about is that is can be detrimental. So the way to challenge that is of course to provide correct information, but also, you know, not to slander them back because getting into the argument is not skillful, right? No one, no one wants to be argued with. No one says, oh, thank, because you came to my street corner and argued with me, I will change my ways. That's, that's not the, <laughs> not usually how we, we get people on our side. Um, even if they cannot abandon evil behavior or practice the good dharma, those who have sunk into the evil paths because of the majestic power of the Tathagata's former vows will be able to hear just for a moment the name of that Tathagata. This will be enough to cause them to be reborn again in human path when their life in the evil path comes to an end. This is very important, right? So it's not instantaneous. It's because of the past connection. If you're able to bring it to mind, then rather than being reborn somewhere else, it propels you back to human life. So this is a good place to re-emphasize the Buddha cannot change your karma. Gods cannot change your karma. Only you can change your karma, right? Um, I, I can repeat, right? Nobody else can change your, your karma. Nobody else can change your mind other than you. What's different here and what you see happening is the Buddhas are opening a doorway or pathway saying, if you can re remember this teaching, if you can bring this to mind, then you can pull yourself out. But they can't literally pull you out. So we resist doing things that are wholesome. <laughs> and as a result, we, we tend to slip down into situations where, where we have trouble. Um, if you consider the story, and I'll put the link to the Dong Huang um, site in the chat if you're interested in reading the kind of summary of the, um, the Buddha's past life story. The reason why the past life stories are there 
is again, this is a gradual technique, right? At some point, slowly, little by little, lifetime by lifetime, the Buddha was able to recognize there's something bigger than himself. And that culminated in, into being a Buddha. It wasn't an instantaneous. So we shouldn't read the Buddha's life story in a vacuum, right? Oh, it was just so easy. Um, you just left the palace and meditated for a few years. Rather, we should see that this is, again, it's a gradual approach. So for us as well, it's a gradual approach. So the, the sutra is offering, um, you know, multiple gradual approaches for us, depending on where we find ourselves and what situation we find ourselves in. Um, I wanted to see if we could get to a little bit farther down. So I'll see if we can make it this evening. Um, they will obtain the correct view, assiduous in practice and self-control and their aspiration. They will uh, be able to abandon the householder's life and enter into a renunciant's life in the desire of this teaching. So here, right, if we wonder how is someone able to enter the path more deeply than others, um, you can again look to the Jataka story. It's highly likely that people who from our perspective, seem to be have an easier time of practice, or have attained more in practice, or you know, perhaps for them it was easy to, um, you know, leave some of the things that hold us back in life. Uh, we'll also likely there is a right, past life story connection to that. Um, they will hold on to correct views and learning. And they will understand extremely profound meanings of the teaching. So this is another one, right? How is it that some people understand things and others don't when they're reading the text? It may come easily. Um, someone told me about a scholarly talk they went to. And the subject of the talk was a particular Buddhist mantra. And they had done tremendous research on the mantra. Um, and they were lecturing on it extensively. And this person asked them, um, you know, through all that study, did you memorize the mantra? And the person said, no, they hadn't memorized the mantra. And it wasn't terribly long. Um, you know, there are some mantras that are like, you know, 30 pages. So I would understand. But, um, you know, they, the person who told me the story was sort of scratching their head, like, you know, all that time you spent studying and yet you didn't commit the mantra to memory and you're, you're lecturing on a whole text talking about the benefits of memorizing the mantra you would think maybe give it a try <laughs> so um we can read and not have any understanding right we can parse a text lecture on a text but still not have any understanding so um, how do we gain a deeper understanding so i mentioned uh this book last time, um, and I looked, it's no longer in print. So I'm gonna read you a couple um, passages from it. So this is a uh, woman in Taiwan and she had translated um, part of the Alatamska Sutra um, on uh, uh, Samantabhadra's vows. And she translated into English. And so this was then given away for free uh, from some of the temples. But she talked about her struggle with translation and then what she did. So um, I'll read you that, that section. It says, the metaphysical conception is certainly quite impossible to express in a completely satisfactory manner, either in speech or writing, and is especially so in translation. Its profound meaning can be entirely lost by even the slightest misinterpretation. So she's recognizing how difficult translating Buddhist text is. I, feel, I fully realize my incompetence in undertaking this work for neither my learning of Buddhism nor my linguistic knowledge entitle me to meet such a difficult task. However, having thoroughly impressed this chapter upon my mind by daily recitation over a considerable period of time, I am intuitively inspired to attempt a translation of it. I hope that later on, if time permits, I may rewrite this version, giving a more accurate translation of it when my studies are more advanced. So I appreciate you know, she wants to translate and provide. She's also recognizing the difficulty, um, but 
her approach is daily recitation over a long period of time to try to really, you know, get a feel for the text, not just uh, dictionary type translation or, you know, unthinking type translation. So then there's an appendix to the translation, which is interesting story. So I'll read that portion also. A few days after having completed the translation of this book, I bought some lotus flowers and presented them in adoration before the pictures representing Buddhas and Bodhisattvas in my private shrine room. To my astonishment, I noticed that one of the lotus flowers had two petals shaped like human hands, each having a thumb crossed upon the other. With the exception of this pair, all the other petals of the said lotus flowers were of normal shape. The regular form of the lotus petal is oval, being neither uh, lobated nor incised. This particular pair having hand shape certainly is unusual. When I removed the said pair of petals from the lotus cup for preservation, I found the thumb of the inner petal was comparatively smaller than that of the outer one because it had not had sufficient time to grow. A picture of them was taken by a professional photographer whom I employed. He was surprised to see them and doubted their genuineness, saying they might be artificial and were perhaps cut into such shape by scissors. However, he came to the conclusion and admitted that they were shaped thus by nature after I pointed out to him that the veins in the petals and the main part ran straight up from the bottom to the top, but some of them were twisted themselves and turned aside in the thumb and followed the thumb shape of it evenly. Moreover, when I first observed the curious formation, the flowers were not fully uh, unfolded, so the thumbs crossed upon each other. No human hands, however skillful, could have them uh, done so as to make them into a human hand without, uh, excuse me, a human hand form without hurting the flower as the petals of the lotus so easily fall at the touch. That is a peculiarity of the lotus. When I saw them the next morning, the thumb of the outer petal had grown larger than the inner one, all proved that they were grown by nature. And pondering over the matter a few days later, it occurred to me to see whether the term lotus hands was given in the Buddhist dictionary, though such a term was unknown to me yet it was actually discovered therein, the Sanskrit um, equivalent being Padmapani. The term il is illustrated by a quotation from the Mahavirachana Sutra as follows. Again, it appears the great, um, excuse me, again appears the grasping diamond, Bodhisattva Samandabhadra of lotus hands. It is indeed remarkable that it tallies both as to the actual material evidence of the existence of lotus hands and also the quotation of the Mahavirachana Sutra agrees with the title of the Bodhisattva who is Samandabhadra, my present book. Um, through her study, what she's expressing is she had a deeper insight and that deeper insight then helped her recognize the unusual formation in the lotus, uh, lotus petals. And then she then reflected on, would I find a similar term in the sutras? And lo and behold, the uh, one of the names for Samantabhadra is Lotus Hands, and she was able to find that in the sutra. So it's a, um, you know, back and forth, study, practice, study, practice, um, being open to a different understanding that comes from not just, I think the type of study we, we often are taught, you know, is this a, um, you know, what are the hermeneutics of this text or what type of text is it, or let's compare it to one or the other, um, rather trying to really find inspiration in the, in the, in the teaching. Um, so I, I appreciated the, the addition, right? So this is going to be the difference between uh, practitioner translating um, versus, you know, dissertation translations that I, we sometimes run upon. See. We might be able to get to no. Well, thought we'd get farther this evening, but that's okay. I had another video for you for some fun, but I don't think we're going to get that far. Um, so here we get the the gradual part. They will gradually practice the different bodhisattva practices and rapidly attain completion of the path to enlightenment. The gradual component is important, right? So it's a gradual. Uh, accumulation, a gradual study. We see that even in the, the text I read, the author is concerned about her translation. So she spends more time reciting the text and try to really understand it and uh, engage with it rather than sort of rush uh, 
is a graduated path, maybe a better translation than gradual, graduated, right? So step by step, not miraculous, not an overnight achievement, rather, you know, gradually you make practice. That is also, um, despite the, uh, you know, a lot of people say, oh, I'm interested in Shingon because Soko Shinjo was enlightenment in this very lifetime. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, enlightenment after one year. Uh, many priests tell me, you know, whatever they learned in seminary as a teenager, a young person, uh, sometimes it's just beginning to, you know, fully unfold their understanding 50 years later. So it's a lot of, of rigorous practice. It's a lot of engagement with the text. Um, it's, it's a lot, it's a lot of work, but in, even in a, one lifetime, it's gradual, right? So we should, we should have that perspective that, um, these graduations, these markers along the path are, are not overnight changes. Let's see. Oh, practice. Okay, so for here. Moreover, Manjushuri, there may be sentient beings who are stingy, jealous, self praising, or who defame others. They will fall into the three evil paths and undergo various kinds of violent suffering for innumerable thousands of years. Um, here again, remember, the Buddha doesn't judge you. He's not the one condemning you to the path. It's just saying this is the karmic consequence from that kind of um, behavior. So, when we encounter the end of a lifetime, they have an opportunity to be reborn as humans, which is what follows. So, after having undergone such violent suffering, after the life ends, they will be reborn as in the human world as um, oxen, horses, camels, or donkeys, right? So the next step is, is this. Um, this is somewhat metaphorical because it's getting at a lack of um, independence. So there's a lack of, um, what's the word? Autonomy, right? So everything here, everything in this list is those things that lack autonomy, right? So what are those? Um, beasts of burden, right? They lack autonomy because they are hooked together. They are uh, whipped, right? It says these animals will be beaten and whipped so if you've ever, um, you know, seen a ox cart or horses, camels, donkeys that are, are carrying heavy loads, um, they have to be urged forward. They will always be afflicted by hunger and thirst and burdened by heavy loads on their backs as they travel the road. If they are able to be reborn as humans, they will still be of low and humble status as slaves and menials. Um, a better translation here is that their conditions will be humble and they will be of lower status. So that's actually a better translation. Um, they will be taking orders from others and serve them. They will never be free. So this is again, the lack of autonomy. It's the summation of this whole category that the, the karmic outcome is a lack of autonomy. So many situations in life, we lack autonomy, whether due to social, political or economic situations. There's a deeper philosophical point here being made that's not specifically in the section, but comes after the discussion of what, you know, people get when they get into trouble is the inability to share or have consideration for others, that this is the karmic consequence, right? So the background teaching is, we should be reading it as, a, as an entire section. It starts off with our inability to give or see our connection with others begins to limit us and it puts us in a situation where we have a lack of autonomy, it's self-imposed, right? It's a self-imposed um, lack of freedom. Think about the current pandemic. We have um, a tremendous amount of selfishness displayed everywhere. Um, you know, people hoard things, they're not thinking about sharing, they're not thinking about you know, who doesn't have um, it's a lack of consideration for um, you know, people wanting us to reduce 
us as vectors of disease transmission and people thinking, no, I'm just thinking of myself. Um, if you take it deeper, it's also a commentary on our philosophical inability to realize no self. And this is the real aspect of the teaching. And it's only hinted at in the original text. But the ultimate concept in Buddhism, right, it starts off with, um, we're so focused on self-preservation and selfishness and stinginess because we have a strong connection to our personal sense of self as we sit here at this moment. We think this is unchanging, this is who we are. We don't recognize the interconnectedness of things. Um, rather, we don't understand um, interdependence, right? Was a better way of, of saying it. That our giving, our generosity actually benefits us because others are not left out. And when others are not left out, then we start to free ourselves from stinginess and clinging to a self, an illusory self that doesn't exist. Um, we just get mired more deeply Right. As we hold on to this, this illusion of self, we just mire ourselves more deeply into samsara. So again, if you read the sutra with compassion goggles, uh, we are in control of our future. It's not a post-mortem salvation teaching. And this isn't about condemning people to suffering. Um, it's about if we don't recognize um, our interconnectedness, then we won't feel free. But if we do recognize it, then we will feel that we have um, autonomy. We will feel always at ease because the Chinese term that's key here, and the reason actually I read, I read you from this book because it reminded me, um, I was retranslating the section because I wasn't really happy with it. It says, you're not um, free, bulls as I. The other name for the Bodhisattva of Compassion, Avalokiteshvara, is Zizai, meaning free, at ease. And so, um, Panjizai, let's see, I think I have a picture here. Oops, not that one. This is a more common view. So this is the Bodhisattva of Compassion, Avalokiteshvara, when she is um, Zazai, completely at ease. So you notice rather than sitting in lotus um, and looking stiff, she's very relaxed, calm, peaceful, um, completely at ease. So understanding one's interconnection, interconnectedness, uh, not clinging to a false self, rather understanding um, compassion, having compassion for all beings results in the state of ease. So the whole section is um, a lead up to this very poetic illusion towards being at ease in the Dharma or achieving this autonomy, this sense self-aware, you know, relaxation that completely suffuses the body because you're no longer pushing people away. You're no longer stuck on a sense of self that is, you know, I wouldn't give a drop of blood, you know, don't ask me for anything. Everybody get away from me. You know, that is People are very tense. The opposite, you know, you are zizai. You are relaxed and calm um, as a result of seeing the teaching. So I had a, a similar uh, translator moment as my, my friend who wrote this book that I got back in 1996. <laughs> So we will pause there because we are almost out of time.
thought we were going to get a little bit further in that section, but we will pick up next time and I'll um, have another fun video for you to watch. Not quite as funny as uh, the, the teacher draft, but um, somewhat on point. So we can have a little bit of humor. But before we finish, are there any questions about, about that section? I have a question, Sensei. Yes. It may be relevant, it may not be relevant. Um, uh, in the context of what you were talking about as far as the gradual nature of the practice and improvement, um, I was thinking of the, the light mantra. Yes. And I've kind of been thinking about the light mantra you know, for a while now. Um, the, the idea that um, through recitation of the light mantra, illusions disappear spontaneously. Um, I've noticed that they don't, for me, disappear spontaneously. <laughs> So I'm wondering uh, your thoughts just on on that in this context. Um, is actually going to be a little bit farther down um, in the same uh, sutra chapter section. So let me see, where's the, yeah. Um, I had hoped to get to here because it actually mentions it um, farther down, but it talks about um the various obstacles that we have because we're creating karma through body speech and mind and so the mantra practice alone is activity of our speech but the sutra later on discusses we're always creating um karma through actions of body speech and mind and so spiritual practice in chingon is a combination of body uh speech mantra and then mind focusing um, either in visualization or calming the mind meditation. So um, when we recite the light mantra, that translation, um, spontaneously, yes, that is possible. Um, it is not, you know, upon your first recitation of the mantra, your, your illusions will spontaneously disperse, um, rather that it is uh, possible to do so. Speaking for myself, I've been reciting the light mantra for uh, a long time. Um, and my illusions did not disperse immediately upon reciting it. Um, I will say aspects of some illusions have dispersed, so it is still um, gradual. But spontaneous versus um, earlier conceptions of Buddhist practice were that, you know, this would take eons, you know, this is going to be 100 billion years before you achieve enlightenment. Um, so this is a much faster method. So um, you know, mantra practice is not unique to Shingon. It is shared throughout the Mahayana schools, but um, it is considered generally to be you know, a faster practice. Um, do we have proof for that? I'd say yes in that you see a lot of people now in the west becoming interested in buddhism um, likely because they have karmic connections to the to the teaching so those seeds are ripening um, and there is a lot of good you know practice happening and there's interest so um, there is a place for as the text says you know people who have been afflicted to you know gain their human birth and continue their practice. So, um, but we, it should, it's not a, you know, three mantra recitation spontaneous. It may be 30 years of practice and, you know, reciting uh, thousands of times, but in the human scale of time compared to geological time, that's still very fast. So I've seen a lot of people change for the better. A lot of people think, you know, very strongly, nobody changes, people are always the same. Um, I'm a little bit more hopeful on that score, but, um, you know, this section of the future also says, 
we're going to make mistakes, right? Those who transgress their vows, right? How do you fix it? So it's a recognition that, you know, we're taking steps forward, we're backsliding, we're taking step forward, but it is possible. That makes sense, thank you. I wish there was a, you know, recite one time, fix everything mantra, but as soon as we recite it, we would undo it because <laughs> we'd be like, oh, I want to get involved in something that's not so good for me. And we, we would do that. And we'd undo our, our, our progress. So any other questions, clarifications? Okay, so we will, as an ending, recite the mantra uh, seven times this evening, and then dedicate merit. So you can put your hands together and gasho, please. Um. Koro koro sendari matogi swaka um 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 koro koro sendari matogi swaka Om Koro Koro Sendari Matogi Swaka. And recitation for Kobodaishi Namo Daishi Hengjo Kongo 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 Namo Daishi Angel Kongo, the echo dedication of merit. Nega waku wa kono kudo kuo mote amane kui sa ni o yo boshi. Orela to shujo to mina tomo ni utsu do o jozen. May these merits be shared by all beings everywhere so that all of us together may attain supreme awakening. Thank you everyone for joining us this evening as we continue to look into the Medicine Buddha Sutra. Um, hopefully, um, you know, as we look into the text and then compare and make connections to other texts, um, even in your own study, as you read different texts, you'll start to see these, uh, these connections. So, um, it, it clicks eventually. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, please have a good weekend. Stay safe. Take care of yourselves. Um, we're supposed to have some lovely weather here in the Portland area. So if you're in Oregon, you know, get some fresh air. Uh, if you're elsewhere, uh, thank you for joining us. And we will see you next week. Take care. Have a good night.